an add-on. Once upon a time, Gary and Naomi went on vacation. <laughs> and actually, a few years ago, we went on Naomi's number one bucket list, which was to see the fjords of Norway. And she picked out the cruise that had the most fjords and the fjords that we thought were the best ones to see. And we had an awesome time. The fjords are water inlets, and it seems like the way Norway is kind of developed is that the hills are very steep, and the very steep hills come down, and there's the water, and then they keep going down very steep. So the fjords are very deep, rather narrow waterways that are quite a lot of them there, but also there are fjords in other places. Um, you know, New Zealand, I think, has fjords, other places, but Chile has fjords, but Norway fjords are amazing. And we had a great time. But, but my passion, what I wanted to see, goes back a number of years when someone, I can't remember who, told me about the Passion Play in Oberammergau, Germany. And uh, so that has been number one for me for quite a while, but it took a while, and the problem is it's a big deal. I'll tell you more about it in a few minutes. And it's hard to get tickets. They're sold out a year, sometimes two years in advance. And, it's, and they only do it every 10 years. It's hard to get tickets. And so finally, Naomi and I, got our tickets to go in 2020. We got our tickets like a, almost a year and a half in advance. And at the time, we couldn't hardly get regular tickets, so we thought, well, let's go on a cruise on a riverboat. And the riverboat, one reason it's hard to buy individual tickets is that there are lots of riverboat companies and other travel companies, and they up buy up blocks of hundreds of and then, and they're all sold. And so it's hard. And so we decided to do that. And then something weird happened. COVID-19 came along and the whole thing was canceled. But we had a chance to either get all our money back or we could leave it in. And they gave us some incentives. So finally in 2022, we were able to go. Well, along with that trip, I, I wrote down here, bad and the ugly, uh, or the interesting, I put in some, something's uh, making funny noises. What we did actually on this trip, no, I, I want to use this, I don't want to have my hands. So what we did actually is we flew to Munich and we rented a car and we had one week around the area of Munich. And I learned things about that. On the, on the good side, um, there were a lot of things on this trip that were just amazing. Uh, one of the tour guides made a joke about, don't, I hope you don't get too much of the ABCs. And it's like, what, what's an ABC? Well, that's another beautiful church, or sometimes another beautiful cathedral. And there are so many of them. Um, the other thing that was part of, of this whole thing was how many of you have seen the movie The Sound of Music? Everybody. Almost, almost everyone has seen The Sound of Music. If you missed it, you got to get it. It's really good. Anyway, the, what, part of what's good is that it's a true story. There is a Captain Von Trapp. He was a decorated hero of the Austrian Navy and Hitler wanted him to run a, a boat for him, and he didn't want to do that, and he had all, his wife died, had all the children, the story you've heard. Of course, the movie was made, much of it was made right there um, in, in the Salzburg area, close to where, right where we were, so we spent a couple of days exploring. So we got to see the actual place that, where they lived and where these things happened, but we also got to visit the places that they filmed because 
For example, the ABC beautiful cathedral, they wouldn't let them film there, but they filmed in another beautiful cathedral about an hour's drive away, and we got to see that cathedral. It was gorgeous. So we saw beautiful things, organ concerts, the second largest organ in the world. Uh, there was, it was the biggest, but some rich dude made one bigger for himself. Um, 18,900 and some pipes in this organ, if you can imagine. And the concert was only about an hour long, but the organist was amazing. And the sound of that thing was just... So there were beautiful things. Uh, maybe one of them might have been the castles, one of them might have been going to, the, to see the horses on one of the ranches, the Hungarian horses. But there were some things you might consider bad. Um, if you're not a fan of World War II, I learned a couple of things there, but I've been to a couple of, of the death camps uh, in Germany before. On this trip, we stopped in Dachau and uh, took a tour of Dachau, which was kind of sobering. And what I didn't realize is all that beautiful music coming from Salzburg, by the way, that word just means salt town because there's huge deposits of salt in the mountains behind the town that is named after the salt mines. But uh, it turns out I didn't realize that Hitler actually loved that valley just, they call it Uber Salzburg or above Salzburg. There's beautiful valleys and mountains and lakes and Hitler fell in love with that area in 1923. He built his house there you know, above Salzburg in that valley and that's where he lived when he wrote Mein Kampf and that's where he had his main headquarters when he was pursuing World War II and world domination was there in right there in that little valley and that's where he dug it wasn't until in the 1990s and early 2000s that they went back and explored the tunnels under that valley where hitler had his headquarters and where he ran much of the war he everything that was available to him in terms of telephones and communications to to pursue the war that was in berlin was right there at his headquarters underground. Uh, at one point at the end of the war, the Allies sent 1,100 airplanes, bombers, 1,100 bombers, fully loaded to, to drop all of their bombs on so that valley where Hitler had his headquarters. If you can imagine, the, each one of those bombers carried tons of bombs. They dropped all of their loads on that little small valley where his house was, which, by the way, all of his other guys, you've heard of Gearing and Goebbels and all these guys, they all had houses there, and all their headquarters down underground. You know how many people were killed by 1,100 bombers fully loaded with bombs? Three. Because Hitler had either... Hitler offered to buy up everybody's land around there, and if you said, sure, no problem, he'd give you really quite a bit of money for it. But if you didn't, he simply drove you off and blew up your house anyway. So there was, there was only this military complex there at the end of the war. The regular people were gone, and they were all underground. One of the people that died just was trying to run to get in the bunker. They knew the planes were coming, and one of the last guys to run and get behind the big steel doors, and a bomb went off, and the steel door, as the man was running, the bomb blast flung the, shut the door very rapidly, killing the man trying to run in at the last minute. Now, he was one of the others, and there were a couple others. Anyway, that's kind of the bad side of stuff. But all of it was interesting, no matter where we were. But the greatest thing on this trip was the Passion Play, and I think you'll agree with me at the end that you may not like the sermon, but you'll like learning about the Passion. I'd like to, for us for right now, to turn to Matthew 28, 16 to 20. Then the eleven disciples left for Galilee, 
going to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him. But some of them doubted. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you and be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So, passion. Uh, what is passion? So the first thing I did is, well, I wanted to make a comment first. Um, last week, Erla said something that just really touched me, and that was when she talked about her and Steve being on this trip this week and wanting the Lord to put someone in their path that they would be able to witness for him. And that really touched me because God has done that for us now for a few years. That when we go places, somehow, somewhere, out of 2,500 people on a huge ship, I meet this old man who it seems, it turns out to be older than I thought he was because he's in pretty good shape. But he was a doctor, he was a surgeon, everything else. And I find that when he had, was forced to retire due to age, he was searching for God. And I've told you the story in previous times where he shared with me that he wanted to know if God was real. So he went, actually went back to school and got a degree in comparative religions. And then he heard my story that I, I had experienced God personally and, and he wanted to hear that. Um, out of 2,500 people, God let me share my story with someone who had been looking. And, and I think that's what Erlis was referring to last week. Up on the board back there, when I ask you to pray for Ron, um, I would never have met Ron, except he was on our riverboat going from Passau down to Budapest. And we got acquainted. He was reading an interesting book. He shared it with me. And we became friends. We went out, even off the boat, went out to dinner with him and his family. And uh, he, I now have an invitation. If I'm in the Atlanta airport, he'll come pick me up and we can spend. And he's coming out here in a few months, assuming his procedures go well. And uh, I plan to spend some time with him here in California. Everywhere we are, no matter where it is, if we're willing, God will use us. So, um, passion. Merriam-Webster. I have to figure out who Miriam is, but it isn't just Webster unabridged. And I was amazed. There were five parts on, in the unabridged dictionary about what passion is, and I was thrilled at their number one. Their number one was the suffering of Christ between the night of the Last Supper and his death. That was the first item that came up on the definition. And then the second half of that one, number one, was the oratorio by Bach, the saint from St. Matthew's, called the Passion. And then there was other things, suffering, emotion, intense driving, mastering feelings, anger, and, uh, and love. I've got a lot of passions, as some of you might guess what some of them are. And I put this thing up here because I'm wondering what some of your passions are. Just real quick so we don't take too much time, but what are, just, just shout them out and I'll put them up on the board here. What are some of the things you're passionate about? Dancing. Dancing. All right. What's another one? What? Worship. I'm sorry? Uh, what's his name? Reading. Reading? Okay. Prayer. Prayer. Uh, maybe grandkids? Yes. <laughs> what's some other things? What? 
Driving? Oh, yeah. It used to be flying for me. But I don't fly too much anymore. You know, for me, I've got to have golf on this list. YouTube. Huh? What? YouTube. Okay, well, there's a lot of things that we can be passionate about. And when, you, again, you look at the definition under, under suffering, a state or capacity where you're acted upon by external agents that mold you and so forth, uh, the fourth one was emotion. And there were like four, three different areas of emotion, one being uh, greed. People can be really greedy uh, to a point of it being a passion. Something where the emotion is distinguished, it's different from reason. Instead of being reasonable, you get so overwhelmed about something, it doesn't matter what. Uh, an intense driving over a mas overmastering feeling or conviction, an outbreak of anger, a crime of passion, and then the last one they used was love, a passion for a woman, uh, a strong liking or desire or devotion for something. And they mentioned, for example, a passion for chess, a passion for opera, which could be golf. It could be a lot of stuff. And then the last couple of things under um, this ardent love thing was sexual passion and so on. Now. If we take a, a look for, I just go on to Matthew 27, 26 to 31 is where I'd like to start because I think it helps us in a way to see Christ's passion for us. So Pilate released Barabbas. He ordered Jesus flogged with a lead whip. Can you imagine a lead whip? Um, lead, lead chunks, in other words, at the end of the whip. And usually the whip would have multiple little tongs at the very end, maybe 12 to 18 inches long, with a piece of lead at the end that they would use. Then turned him over to the Roman soldiers to be crucified. Some of the governor's soldiers took Jesus into their headquarters and called out to the regiment. They stripped him and put scarlet robes on him. They wove thorn branches into a crown and put it on his head. And they placed a reed stick in his hand as a scepter. Then they knelt before him in mockery and taunted, Hail to the king of the Jews! And they spit on him and they grabbed the stick and they struck him on the head with it. And when they were finally tired of mocking him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes back on him again and led him away to be crucified. Uh, I asked you how many people saw The Sound of Music. How many of you saw Mel Gibson's Passion of the Christ? Quite a, quite a few of us. I think maybe that movie might be the movie more than any other I can think of where it the way they depicted the brutality against Jesus was maybe the worst I've ever seen with my own eyes. But from everything I understand and have studied, Mel Gibson didn't come close. When, when Satan and every evil thing that exists came to try to destroy Jesus, I think Mel, Mel Gibson probably did the strongest uh, depicting that as, as close to reality as he could, but Hollywood just can't do that. Well, as I mentioned, the passion play of Oberammergau is an amazing thing. The thing that got me so excited about it, and I can't even remember who told me about it, it's been a few years, but to realize that 388 years ago, <laughs> uh, COVID-19 was going across Europe. They called it the Black Plague. 
And as I was looking and reading some more, it also turns out that there was a 30 years war situation. The King of Sweden was involved in, in the war and there were some invasions as well as the, the, what was going on with the plague. Uh, during that time, entire villages, uh, there's, I was reading about some entire villages where only a few children were still alive and everybody else in the village was dead. And it was a very bad time. And for some reason, the people of Oberamaga came together from their little small village. And they met in the graveyard in behind their church. And they petitioned God if he would save them. They made a promise that they would do the passion play. They would tell his story. Their town would do that. And they would do it every 10 years forever. And for what's amazing is that from, according to all the records I've been able to see in a, three or four books, no one else that lived in that community died after that day from the plague. Now, I did find in this other book over here that there were three or four people that, that died in Oberammergau, but they were not residents of Oberammergau. They were people who heard something was happening and they snuck in and then they died. But no other people that actually were residents of that town died. And so for 400 years now, every 10 years, uh, I didn't realize it started out every 10 years. I thought maybe they did it every year and they got tired of it or something. But the original commitment that they made was every 10 years. And then in the 1680s or something, they changed it from 63 to the, a year ending in a zero. So every 10 years, the first few years were odd numbers and then they changed it 340 years ago or something. Now, if you look at the Passion Play now, this year it ran from May 14 to October 22. That's four and a half months that the play is going on. Uh, it runs five days a week, from, except they have Monday off and Wednesday off. Don't know why, but that's it. This year, they did the play 103 times, okay? It started in 1634, um, and it's been 388 years. There were three times the play was delayed by two years, including this year, it was delayed from 2020. Uh, I found it fascinating since we'd been in Hitler's lair that Hitler did, allowed them to put on the play when he was in control of Austria near his headquarters. And from what I can tell, Hitler thought that since the Jews killed the Christ, that that was anti-Semitic. So he thought that was a good message against the Jews. Of course, that's the one cool thing about Jesus. You can talk to him in any language. He can understand you. But if you talk to him in Hebrew or Aramaic, he doesn't have to translate. Um, one of the things that was kind of strange for me uh, with the church group that I kind of grew up in, uh, it wasn't very friendly to Catholics as a child. And of course, this play was, there weren't very many Lutherans in 1634. Luther hadn't been born yet. So uh, this was a, a group of Catholics. The first person who took on writing this play out of the Bible and putting it on in the 1630s was the local parish priest. And it's continued since then. And those people believe different than me, you know. It's a performance by the community. It's, um, 
originally, if you wanted, if you wanted to be in the play, and you wanted to have a part in the play, originally you had to be number one born there, and you had to live there, and if you weren't born and living in that town, you weren't allowed to participate in the play. It's pretty hard now to find enough people after 400 years. Uh, so they have a new, much easier rule. The rule is you have to be a resident of Oberammergau for 20 years. So if I wanted to be in the play, and I'd love to actually, but first we'd have to move to Germany and live there. Secondly, we wouldn't qualify because the next one will be in eight years. And we have to have 20, and we wouldn't qualify for the next one because that would be 18 years. So I'd have to wait, live in Oberammergau for 28 years before I'd be allowed. And then I'd be just a simple good old age of 103. Um, it impacts the whole village. Uh, you know, Chuck, you might put that first picture up of the stage and so on so you get a sense of what that looks like. Um, we were sitting, uh, we were sitting about in here somewhere. Uh, we had pretty good seats, uh, maybe a third or less than a third, a quarter way back maybe. Uh, basically one to two years, but usually about two years, I, I have a picture in here of a big poster that gets put up in the street that says the play is coming and as of this date, the men are not allowed to shave or cut their hair. So for about two years, if you're a boy, a teenager, or an old guy, you cannot cut your hair or cut your beard, and women similarly. Children produce their own play and, and present it to the town, usually about six months before the big play. Uh, the impact on the schools during the play is amazing. People plan their lives around this performance. So for example, if you're planning to get married, well, you're, you're, there's no way you're going to have a, you're going to get married the year that the play is on. And then you also want to think about your plans for children. Because children love to be in the play. And almost just many, many children. So you're going to want to plan your pregnancy. So you don't want to have a, they only use like one infant in the whole play. So you want your kid to be at least four, five, six, seven years old. So when you get married, you sort of plan that out. Uh, you don't want to have a kid that's nine years old. He missed out on the younger part. Now he's starting to look like a big guy at, ten, at nine or 10. Travel plans, wor working plans, people who are so committed to the play that they won't take a job unless they can stay a resident and commute. Um, the script and the music gets revised every 10 years. And that get, the, all during that time, there's going, that's going on. Major parts are additioned way ahead because the amount of learning uh, for the principal players, um, it's in German. And it'll always be in German, according to what I've read. So Naomi and I each had one of these. This is a script, every word that it translated into English, so that we could follow along in English. Although my German's not too good, I could, hear, I could keep up a little bit. And of course, the play lasts, how long do you think the play would be? What do you think? Hour and a half? Two hours. Two hours? Between five and a half and six hours. Okay. And they stop, they stop for, uh, for dinner in the middle. So you watch for about two and a half, three hours. And then 
In our case, because we were on a tour, there were several ships and so many buses just with our company and then many other companies that do the same thing. So in our case, all of the um, Viking people went to a big hall and where they arranged to feed all of us in one place. And it was, it was quite good. Now, it's dark uh, when we're done. And so it's hard, you know, lights are all down. So I bought this, it says Passion Play on it. And you turn it on and it's kind of bright and now I can follow along, you see. Um, think of the impact of the story of the Christ. Something I want to tell you a little bit, and there's a few pictures we'll start in a minute that, that I think will help this come to life. But first of all, you've got the story of Jesus, kind of like what it said in the definition, kind of going through early on before Christ is arrested and going through to the crucifixion and then going through until he is standing in front of the cross they washed most of the blood off, and he's got a cleaner robe on. And then he's saying some things about being alive and what that means to everyone there. Think, and then during that play, which is kind of the end of Christ's life for a period of quite a period of time, but in that they want to remind you and put in context what Jesus has been doing and saying. So they go all the way back to the Old Testament. Many of you might remember how Roger used to have tablo, uh, a tableau in the big building at Celebration Center. So there would be people in a sort of a screen up behind. You remember that? Well, they have tableaus here, but it's kind of in the middle. Uh, in this area here, uh, in this area, they'll be pull, pull a curtain across and they'll be acting going on in front and a donkey going by, whatever, while they put the tableau together, several of them. And then the choir, um, that must have been from 2010. Our choir was in black. But um, well, the choir might be getting ready to sing and they, they've got a, a song that goes along with maybe an Old Testament story, maybe the burning bush, maybe some other part of the Bible story of Jesus that puts his death and resurrection in context, and then they'll sing a song uh, and so on, and then the tableau will open and you'll see this beautiful thing. That's one of the things. But imagine the impact on the participants musicians get together and the orchestra just sounds magnificent. They're down underneath, so you can't see them. And then you wonder, how does the choir follow the director that they can't see? Because he's underneath them. And actually, you can't really see it on this side. And later you'll see that we're sitting in a domed building protected from the elements, but it's sunlight in front of us or nighttime stars. And in the building up to the left, I saw a giant TV, and it had a picture of the director. So the choir up here can actually see. Yeah, there you go. That, let's look at that picture. Um, right up in here was a very, very large TV. And I could see the director down here in the TV. So if you were in the choir, let's just leave that picture up for a minute. Uh, the choir could stay with the orchestra when they're singing. Think of the impact on the crowd. Uh, at the end of this story, five and a half, six hours later, I, I was in tears. Uh, the major parts, the speaking parts, uh, last, uh, 10 years ago, there was a time uh, when Two people that play Caiaphas both thought the other one was doing it that day, and both of them were out of town. 
and they're getting ready to go on stage and there's no Caiaphas. And the director is, doesn't know what to do, but his father is there and his father says, 20 years ago, I was Caiaphas and I can play my part, I can do Caiaphas. So that night, they had a 20 year old Caiaphas. Now, <laughs> the words have all changed. <laughs> Because every 10 years, they're making modifications and changing the script. It turns out Caiaphas' 20-year-old speech was 15 minutes longer than the Caiaphas speech for the current year. But uh, he pulled it off beautifully and nobody knew the difference. One of the th impacts that was moving to me as I read about this and they're in this book here, there's pictures of G the people who played Jesus going back 300 years. Uh, who they, they know who some of them were and all that. Every person who has been chosen to play Jesus, there's always two. And by the way, whoever opens the first night never closes. The other guy does the closing night, or one, vice versa. There's always two, and they go back and forth five days a week. Every one of these people, that have, they write their comments of what it was like to be Jesus. And every one of them just said it, it totally and completely changed their life. You just couldn't go through what he did and go on and off that cross and not be impacted in amazing ways. But what about the audiences? A lot of us are believers. I, I enjoyed being on the riverboat because virtually everybody on the riverboat had a ticket to go to the play. And if you wanted to go see the Passion Play of Christ, you probably were a Christian. Well, it's a, it's a very affirming experience for someone who believes. But I'm amazed at the percentage of people who are not believers. They just, they're going for, because of the art and the experience, even knowing full well we all came from frogs out of the pond. But uh, there's no God or anything, but they wanted to see this passion. And my last comment on that, imagine the impact on the country of Germany. Imagine the impact on the world because people come to see this from everywhere, just absolutely everywhere. One morning this last week, I woke up overwhelmed with emotion and tear. I think because I had written, I had gone through and written this thing the day before most likely, and I was just, I, I was just overwhelmed. I just got up and, and just sat there and thought about what, what Jesus did for me. He volunteered to save me and to save you. He left a perfect heaven, beaten, tortured beyond description, not even possible for Hollywood to depict. He spoke of the separation from the Father and how that was so difficult for him and what he did for me. It makes me think what I should do. And then I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, no, he's not asking me to do. He wants me to be something. Actually, he wants us to live our lives as his friends. Where he is in us and we are in him. Our being willing to allow the Holy Spirit, as Steve says so often, we don't do good works. The Holy Spirit living in us does good works. That's why we can't boast. To worship him in everything we do in his power. Uh, follow me with these closing texts. 
Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not disaster, to give you a future and a hope. I gotta wear a hat when I'm doing this. This is uh, Passion 2020. It was actually 22. And I got my Passion Play pin right there. There we go. John 14, 1 to 3. Don't let your heart be troubled. Trust in God and trust in me. There are more than enough rooms in my father's home. If this were not so, I wouldn't have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you so that you will always be with me where I am. John 14, going down to verse 12. I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes in me, does that include some of you guys? Anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done, and even greater works, because I am going to be with the Father. Verses 16 and 17 of John. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. Verses 19 and 20. Soon the world will no longer see me but you will see me. Since I live, you also live. When I am raised to life again, you will know that I am in my Father. Now, has he been raised to life already? When that happens, we will know that he is in his Father, that you are in me, him, and I am in you. Verses 25 to 29. I am telling you these things now while I am still with you. But when the Father sends the advocate as my representative, that is the Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything and will remind you of everything I have told you. I am leaving you with a gift. Peace of mind and, and heart. And the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or be afraid. Remember what I told you. I'm going away, but I will come back to you again. If you really loved me, you would be happy I'm going to the Father, who is greater than I am. I have told you these things before they happened, so that when they do happen, you will believe. What happened? We will believe. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your passion for me. Give me more understanding and passion for you. Live in me, live in every one of us here, Lord, so that I can allow you to bless others through me. I love you, Lord. The cool thing of this whole story is not that he died for us, which is amazing, but that he came back to life and lives for us. And because he's alive, we have everything. Let's sing that together now with a hat on. <laughs>